Good morning, good morning. I'm Greg Costco, the chair of the San Francisco Chamber of Commerce and the president and CEO of Hathaway Dinwiddie Construction Company. On behalf of the chamber, the chamber's board of directors, the San Francisco Center for Economic Development, and our presenting sponsor, Wells Fargo, welcome to Forecast SF. Forecast is San Francisco's leading economic summit. As our economy becomes increasingly linked to the global, global landscape, it's important for all of us to understand and prepare for the opportunities that are forthcoming for San Francisco and the Bay Area for our continued economic growth. And I want to add my good morning as well. I'm Bob Lynchide, President and CEO of the San Francisco Chamber. Um, I think one thing describes the uh, feeling of this room today, and that's optimism. Clearly, uh, Forecast SF or hashtag Forecast SF on your Twitter dial, uh, we're pleased to, uh, to offer a program today that we think will be very beneficial to the, to the understanding of, of San Francisco's economy. We'll start off this morning with uh, Dr. John Sylvia, Chief Economist from Wells Fargo Bank, and also to provide us the economic forecast. Megan Smith, entrepreneur and VP for Google X, will present collaboration, talent, and innovation in the 21st century. Following that discussion will be a panel with uh, Shelley Dorn, uh, WebCore Builders Executive and key uh, chair of our Build SF program to discuss development projects and their local impact. Following uh, that panel, we're pleased to have UC professor Dr. Enrico Moretti, who's also, also the author of The New Geography of Jobs. Uh, and finally, batting cleanup, our own Mayor Edwin Lee on building the economic infrastructure of our city of tomorrow. So let me uh, take a brief moment to acknowledge the sponsors that have helped make this event possible. Of course, our presenting sponsor, Wells Fargo, our developer sponsors, CPMC Sutter Health and Dignity Health, our Pacesetter sponsors, Gensler, Moss Adams, WebCore Builders, and a special thank you to our media sponsors, San Francisco Chronicle and San Francisco Business Times, and a special thank you to SF City for helping us promote this event. Greg? We also welcome the many elected leaders and city officials who have joined us for today's discussion. Now, uh, one, one, one uh, housekeeping business, Bob, there, no cards have been passed around and are available uh, along the, the aisleways. We encourage a lot of audience participation, so as you get a thought, please uh, scribble a note. Uh, chamber representative will collect it, and uh, your questions and thoughts will be shared with the audience. Now to introduce our keynote speaker, uh, please welcome to the stage the Executive Vice President and Regional Manager of Commercial Banking for Wells Fargo, and we're announcing today the 2014 Chair-Elect of the San Francisco Chamber of Commerce, Mr. Peter Grubley. I told Greg if he didn't get the announcement right, he had to stay, so. I think he missed it by that much, and he's going to have to stick around for a while. Um, thank you, Bob and Greg, for that introduction, and I'm really looking forward to joining the, the members of the chamber and the leadership of the chamber in um, you know, helping direct the business community uh, and our representation of the business community for the years to come. Um, been fortunate to be part of Wells Fargo for a very long time. And I think that we in San Francisco have been fortunate to have Wells Fargo and the Chamber of Commerce here in San Francisco for over 160 years. And it is our focus uh, to create a vibrant and sustainable economic environment for the future of this city. This morning, I have the pleasure of introducing uh, Dr. John Sylvia. John has been with Wells Fargo since 2002. Uh, prior to that, he was the senior economist for the U.S. Joint Economic Committee and chief economist for the U.S. Senate Banking, Housing, and Urban Affairs Committee. 
He's been uh, recognized by many organizations, including Bloomberg News, USA Today, the Donald L. Ream uh, Elementary School newspaper, and uh, probably a few other things for his economic forecasts, which I understand are, he's recognized because he's correct more than 100% of the time. Is that right? Yes, Excellent. So we're really looking forward to your presentation today. Thank you, doctor. Yeah, that elementary school was a nice touch. I, I thought that was pretty cool. Uh, uh, just very quickly, uh, it's interesting, uh, Enrico and I uh, both presented at a conference in San Francisco earlier this week, so it was funny when we ran into each other again here, uh, both of us uh, speaking this morning. Very quickly, uh, just in terms of the presentation, um, it's available to anyone. Uh, it's all public information. Uh, feel free to use it. Obviously, we're not going to go through all the slides, but I did try to be comprehensive in terms of the outlook both for the U.S. economy and the San Francisco Bay Area in general. So uh, feel free uh, to use the slides as best you can. Also, there's a, a simple one-page handout that uh, some of you may have seen on employment. Uh, just to let you know, Wells Fargo has an open website in terms of its economics. So anytime you want to go to our website and, and look at economic issues and some discussions, feel free to go to that website and, again, use that material as you see fit. All of my presentations, uh, including every internal presentation I do at Wells Fargo, uh, begins with trying to understand the basic fundamentals. It's, it's very important to have a framework for economic due diligence. Uh, before you go off and do all the brilliant things you do, all of this all, always takes place within the context of what is economic growth, what is inflation, interest rates, grow, uh, profits in the dollar. So that'll be a little bit of the framework we're gonna go through pretty quickly, but then focus a lot more on the regional economy. Uh, as you see here, uh, what we get in the U.S. economy is around two, two and a half percent growth. And we've had that now, and this will be the fourth year of that pace of economic growth. So this is not the typical economic recovery that we've had in the past in the U.S. We've not had periods of five or six percent growth. We've not had sustained growth at three and a half to four percent. There's a lot of different factors for that, but I think it's again important to understand for the national economy, it's still growing at around two, two and a half percent. And one thing that really is different as you see this graph here is the public sector. Uh, the public sector in terms of spending has really downshifted compared to earlier economic recoveries, and that uh, is one significant difference there. Small business has not recovered to the extent that it had prior to the 2007-2009 recession. Uh, so once again, you can see there's a big difference here. Uh, the economy, yes, is growing, but the distribution of growth is different than what we've seen in the past. And here in manufacturing, you can see almost a typical cycle, uh, which again is kind of fascinating to people. Also. In terms of manufacturing in the United States, we produce more today than we ever had in the United States. Uh, manufacturing is globally competitive. We export more than anyone else. And the important point is that we have to make a difference between manufacturing and manufacturing employment. Manufacturing, producing more than ever before, and we're doing it with a lot less workers. So when you hear the problem about manufacturing, it's not manufacturing. Manufacturing is doing fine, thank you very much. All right? The problem really is with manufacturing jobs, and that's a change in terms of technology and how we work over time. Here you can see jobless claims continue to go down. My single best indicator for the overall strength of the economy, if you have to depend upon one indicator, this is it, and jobless claims continue to show that the economy has momentum. So we're not going to drop off the cliff next month. We're not going to drop into a recession. Uh, no, we've got momentum going forward. But we do have structural changes in the U.S. economy, and again, uh, 
I think Enrico will emphasize this in his presentation, but this is one of the topics that came up quite a bit in the conference that Enrico and I were both at. The employment population ratio has changed. It has shifted. There are far fewer people working in a percentage of our U.S. population than before. That presents particular challenges in terms of achieving growth. You can see why it's hard to get 3 to 4 percent GDP, but it's also a challenge in terms of entitlement. You get a far less far fewer people working to pay all the bills of everybody else. So again, that's a challenge in our society. And here you can see, again, a change in full-time versus part-time employment in the U.S. economy. Are we stuck a little bit, maybe? Uh, another thing I think impo is important, and again, Enrico will touch upon this a little bit, is participation rates. And I have these two lines up here to show you that what's really fascinating is a lot of people are, are focused in on that black line. Uh, male and female young persons' t labor force participation rate has gone down pretty dramatically. Uh, they're just not in the labor force like they used to be. We all know about demographics and the retirement of the baby boom and that male uh, labor force participation rate has been going down for over 20 or 30 years. But I, I think what's really fascinating is, again, that blue line. And, and that's the female prime age, 25 to 54. Their participation rate has also declined. So the labor force in the United States has changed, is changing, and is evolving in a way we're not used to. And again, I think Enrico, Enrico's uh, presentation will emphasize that as well. The consumer, uh, again, you can see here in this graph that the consumer is spending money. So the consumer's not dead, it's not going away, consumers continue to spend. They're just not spending as much as they did in the past, and that has implications in terms of uh, state retail sales taxes, city retail sales taxes, uh, et cetera. Income growth, again, uh, the distribution of income growth, you can see that third, 20%, the middle income growth. Since 1984, they've had the least income growth. And again, you can see why the, a lot of political and social issues with respect to that middle income group. Now, I don't call it middle class because I have no idea what class means, uh, but I can measure income. And uh, when you look at income, you can see, again, that struggling middle income group in America. Another thing that surprises a lot of people is wages and salaries are only 47% of income in the United States. Uh, people think about, well, you have to work to have a living. No, actually, you don't. Uh, you know, more than 50% of income comes from something other than work, and I think that's, that's important to recognize in the 21st century for us. Uh, housing we do think is coming back. But again, uh, this graph is one graph we talked about last year, and I think, again, it, you can see the same story over and over again, uh, and particularly for San Francisco. Uh, we built a lot of big homes over the last 30 years, and families kept on getting smaller. And it changes the dynamics of what kind of housing you expect to have in the future, especially with younger, a younger generation that wants to be more urban, more mobile, uh, not interested in cutting a lot of grass on Saturday morning. So, oops, skipped away too, too quickly. Yeah. Uh, here again, home prices, uh, clearly home prices have exceeded uh, what's happening with mortgage rates. So no, I don't expect a big housing correction in a bubble. Home prices will slow down, hopefully, because we don't want a repeat of what we saw in the past. But we do expect that housing will continue to gain momentum going forward over time. Uh, inflation remains somewhat persistent, around 2% or so. Uh, again, it, we're not having deflation, but we're not having roaring inflation. So once again, when you're doing your calculus about how business is operating, 1.5% uh, to 2% inflation seems to be the number uh, to focus in on. And energy prices, surprisingly, if you look at world oil prices, Despite all the discussion about the Great Recession, et cetera, et cetera, you can see that world oil prices have recovered every bit as much as what they were before that uh, spike. So again, uh, oil is still the way we use transportation. It's a dominant form of, of getting things from here to there. And another thing that's kind of interesting, at least from my point of view, is that uh, Surprisingly, there's a lot of financing going on. So credit is available for those who can qualify. 
And you can see here what's surprising in terms of bond issuance, there's more bonds being issued after 2007 than ever before. That's high grade bonds. Here's high yield bonds, same story. And here's uh, business lending, again, uh, hitting new highs all over again. So again, there's a lot of credit out there uh, that's financing a lot of activity in the United States. And then finally, uh, profits. I think it's important just to recognize that more and more, and particularly for the San Francisco area, uh, more and more profits are generated globally for U.S. corporations. And again, the, this graph didn't come out quite right when it got translated here. But uh, I think it's surprising for a lot of people to realize that these American corporations uh, have over 50% of their sales abroad, and some of them you might actually work for. Uh, but I think it, it, it's kind of fascinating when you think about this whole process um, that you can actually have a global investment portfolio by buying a lot of US companies that truly operate globally. And you can see how tied in we are to the global economic system over time. Okay, so a little bit about San Francisco. Uh, again, outpacing the state and the nation with its improvements in per capita income, the labor market, and the housing market. So congratulations. Uh, you know, same speech as last year, you know. Uh, again, multifamily building permits, you gotta expect that. Uh, land is incredibly expensive. Your codes are very, very high standard. And again, housing affordability, it remains the issue. Uh, strong per capita income, well-educated workforce, and you'll see this especially uh, in Enrico's presentation, uh, by a prominent tech sector should bolster the San Francisco economy in the year to come. I'll steal one of Enrico's points, because I mentioned this to him earlier this morning, that I thought was particularly interesting. He's gonna have one graph that shows that despite what some people might say, having a very prosperous top end also means a very, very prosperous middle income group. And uh, one of those graphs really struck me as kind of fascinating that in San Francisco you can have very, very well-paid middle-income type of employment. Uh, and I think that's fascinating. Uh, and again, uh, nice, nice work. Um, here's your gross state product. But again, as you suspect, look at California uh, in terms of 2012, certainly outperforming the nation. So it, it does seem rather interesting that you are, continue to be more volatile than the rest of the nation. Uh, and again, the ups are bigger, the downs are bigger, um, and so now we're on the up cycle, so have a good time. <laughs> uh, Non-farm employment in terms of US, but also California. You can see that the growth in California employment has uh, really reached the same paces of growth um, that you had in a prior uh, economic recovery lens. To, if I can get this right, I think, right there, yeah. Um, but not quite as high as it was in the 1990s. So again, you do have job growth. Uh, you are gaining employment in this state overall. And here's uh, the California unemployment rate. Uh, once again, far more volatile. You, you, you do have a state that has bigger ups and bigger downs. But notice how dramatically, how quickly your unemployment rate is coming down. So by the time we do this meeting again next year, it'll probably be the same rate of unemployment generally. Uh, housing permits, you can see the recovery there, and then the core logic, and you know, once again, you can see the unaffordability of California real estate taken off, unless you want to live 200 miles east of here. Uh, but uh, basically, it's, it, you have, again, that, that very volatile system. You don't have a lot of land. Um, and the land that's very valuable is basically all built on. So uh, that's the challenge of having a very, very uh, tight uh, land allocation system. Uh, tax revenues, uh, once again, incredibly volatile, as you can see from the graph on the left-hand side. And your budget gaps are uh, shrinking over time. Uh, so again, but you know this, uh, many people have commented about the California tax system uh, being a very, very progressive 
uh, with a significant percentage of your tax revenue coming from a very, very small income base, and that tends to generate that kind of volatility over time. So again, it, it tends to demand of you a lot of budget discipline over time. Uh, here's your metro area unemployment rates. And again, I compared it to major international cities. Uh, again, uh, as many of you know, I, I've long argued that San Francisco is just different. Miami is just different. Uh, Boston, New York, they're, they're truly international cities. Uh, and when you look at the uh, unemployment rates and, and where they are, you can see, again, uh, unfortunately, uh, San Francisco has the lowest unemployment rate, um, which uh, means it's going to be hard to hire somebody cheap. But, you know, that's the way it goes. <laughs> so here again, uh, you know, you are, uh, you are different. Uh, here's your per capita income uh, for San Francisco versus other areas of the state. Um, so you are the evil rich people that I mentioned last year when I was here. Uh, so congratulations. Uh, you can blame yourself for your own prosperity and success. Uh, but uh, again, uh, it, it's pretty, pretty dramatic. And I would suspect that this graph is not going to change that much over the next three to five years. Uh, you will continue to be, again, a highly rewarded, highly skilled labor force. That's the nature of the character. Uh, it is different. Um, as I've mentioned before to a lot of people, each different metropolitan area, and again, this is one of Enrico's interesting points uh, in his presentation, each different area has its own characteristic in terms of its labor supply, in terms of its resources. And that characteristic tends to drive the employment base and therefore the income in that area. And uh, one of the classic questions I think Enrico might have, or comments he might have on the California situation is, when I look at this, I recognize San Francisco as sort of like a tier one type of city. But then the question is, what do you do with the middle income cities? And that, that's an interesting challenge, I think, for the state of California overall. So here's your metro area um, housing permits. Again, you can see multifamily. The brown line has really taken off. And then it, again, here's your core logic numbers in terms of home prices. Uh, once again, you're off to the races in terms of what goes on. Uh, again, uh, in terms of uh, you know, the problems that we have, we talk about negative equity in places. We talk about foreclosure rates, and here's San Francisco. So again, it's very, very, I know some, for some time, there's all like a disconnect. Like I'm reading the newspaper about all this unhappiness and foreclosures and delinquencies and negative equity, and I live in San Francisco, and I've got very little of that. So again, it creates uh, an impression of how unique this environment is here. And then uh, here's commercial real estate. Uh, surprisingly, you know, if you look at this graph, it's, it's really interesting. Here's retail vacancy rates. If you, if you saw the national number, and you can pull it up, it's earlier in the presentation, the, the retail vacancy rate goes like this on the national level and stays up here. Here, like, okay, where is the recession? You know, I mean, it's like, okay, you know, what happened? It's nothing. Um, here's your office vacancy rate where there's a lot of restructuring in terms of jobs. Um, here's your warehousing. But again, when you look at apartment vacancy rates, you're actually lower than you were before. The retail is unchanged. Very, very interesting uh, sort of cosmopolitan, very urban kind of feel about this city in an age of prosperity that is very, very different than what you see in other cities and, and nationally. Um, again, your office, uh, again, notice here, what we always look at is, you know, vacancy rates coming down, and they certainly have come down, and here's your net absorption in terms of, you know, picking up that space. Here's your apartment vacancy rates. Notice, notice how you're, you're even better here than you were prior to the recession, so your vacancy rates are, are just amazingly low here, and again, your warehouse uh, vacancy rate. So, uh, visitors, his, uh, it was interesting. Um, I was doing an asset liability meeting at Wells Fargo, and Michael Laughlin, who runs Credit Risk, uh, was coming into the meeting, and he said, John, you know, it's, it's really hard to get a hotel in this city. And, and luckily, sheer luck, I had actually used this graph in my presentation to the meeting. And so, yeah, it's true, you know. <laughs> <laughs> And, and as, you know, as I was, was talking to a couple of my colleagues here, um, they've already said, basically, you know, you got a problem with the Super Bowl, you know? Um, you're going to have everybody, I guess, camping out at the National Park to get to the Super Bowl game. 
but again, you can see the, the real dyna dynamism here that makes it very, very unique. Here's your workforce. Uh, again, this is, uh, it's, it's, inter I mean, it's, it's interesting because again, you'll see something like this in Enrico's presentation. And believe it or not, the two of us did not co corroborate before on this presentation. So the fact that we have such, well, it may be dangerous if two economists are actually saying the same thing, it could be dangerous. But anyway, um, but here again, population with a college degree really makes a big difference and again, creating the uniqueness that is San Francisco, San Jose, Boston kind of markets. And then again, for those of you that hate the Dodgers, here's Los Angeles. <laughs> so. so anyway, that's some of the publications we put out and I'm open to questions, comments, thoughts you might have. Uh, again, I know it's challenging. Um, it's, it's like in the old days, if you, if you remember one of, the, one of the great stories in baseball is that it's oftentimes very true that if you have a, a great baseball player, it, it oftentimes doesn't make a good manager. Uh, when you think about Babe Ruth or Ted Williams and they tried to be managers and it didn't work, because they were so exceptional, they, they almost couldn't see the other side. And I think in San Francisco, you are so exceptional, you have to stop and realize, wait a minute, we're not the average American city. We are very unique, we are very different, um, and uh, again, it, it's kind of an interesting perspective. Um, go, go ahead, Peter. Uh, so we have a question from the crowd. Uh, can you comment on the costs associated with healthcare costs and how that will impact the economy and employment? Uh, okay, so that's probably a national economic question, yes. I assume. Um, I would suspect that as an economist, healthcare is always a superior good. Uh, in the sense that as people's income rises, they tend to be willing to spend more on that good. Uh, I think also as you, you realize as people age longer and longer, that healthcare costs tend to rise. So, so my argument would be with those two factors, healthcare costs are gonna continue to rise for the next 200 years, okay? Uh, end of story. I mean, that, that's, that's the nature of the game. Um, you, and compound that, especially in my generation as a baby boomer, okay? So this is one area where Enrico and I do differ because he's much younger, actually more handsome, and his accent's really good. I mean, my accent's <laughs> bad, his accent's really cool. Anyway, um, the baby boom generation like me, huge expectations. And again, that's another problem we have. Uh, baby boomers, as you can see, it doesn't take long to watch TV and realize you've got a pill for this and a pill for that and a pill for this other thing. And so as a baby boomer, a lot of these ads pretend that at 70 years old, you're gonna go out surfing somewhere, all right? Or you're gonna sit in a tub looking, overlooking the ocean or something, you know? It doesn't happen like that, okay? But, but, the problem, but the problem you have is if you have a whole bunch of people like me who have those expectations, they're gonna try to live those expectations, so again, I would say that over time, healthcare costs are gonna to continue to rise faster than the average inflation rate over time. Yes? I need a second to recover with the bathtub yeah. combo. <laughs> <laughs> are we heading for another tech bubble? Why or why not? Ah, we talked about that earlier this morning. M my answer would be no. I think what's different now is a couple of different things. One, it, your products are far more global than they've been before. If you think about what you went through in the 70s and 80s and then in the early 1990s in the, the dot-com bubble, a lot of this was domestic consumption, domestic behavior. Now it's a global product and you're providing that product globally. Second, I think the use of the product has been far more pervasive in everything we do than it ever was before. I think it was always a game, a trinket, sort of a lot of fun, but now this process invades everything and I think it makes a big difference. So I think the product is different and I think the market is different. So I don't see it as the same, quote, type of tech bubble that we saw before. Um, so no, uh, I'm sure that at some point in time there will be a correction, but I don't see it as the dramatic ups and downs of the past. If you could dive a little deeper into the decline in public spending or a lack of recovery, can you talk a little bit more about that? 
Yeah, the, the decline in public spending. I, I again go back to that GDP graph, and I and I right at the beginning, and the the challenge you had, and California is a great example of that. For the last 30 or 40 years, you've had governors and state legislatures who always expected and planned on California having this amazing economic recovery boom, 4%, 5% GDP. Okay, that was the idea. And if you had 4%, 5% GDP, you wouldn't have a budget problem. Uh, you wouldn't have a state pension problem. You wouldn't have city pension problems. You wouldn't have state retiree health care problems. You wouldn't have any of that. But you don't have 4 to 5%. You got 2 2.5%. And again, it, it's a challenge because when you're sitting here in San Francisco, you see one economy, but I'm sure many of you travel throughout the state and see a very, very different economy. And the challenge always is, and, and, and economists talk about this concept about time inconsistency or time consistency. Um, many of us, when we become parents, we, we sort of say to our kids, hey, you know, you study hard, you work hard, I'll help you pay for college. Well, 15 or 20 years later, guess what? the bill shows up, and you have to make good on that. Well, if you think about the way state governments or local governments do or run, all right, the guy who's running the, the business today becomes a U.S. senator. He's gone, okay? Or becomes a president. He's gone, all right? And all of a sudden, the problem today becomes the problem for the governor today when it was all those promises that are made for the last 30 or 40 years. So the problem in public spending and why public spending has really taken a hit, both on the state and local level, is because we don't have the growth that we used to have, and especially the spreading out uh, of the growth, as I mentioned, in terms of that middle income group that you see up there. So I think that's the number one problem. We're not getting the growth that we expected and planned on. And for many of you, uh, when you see the Congressional Budget Office report in another month or two, Look what happened in what they talk about potential GDP. Um, you know, we had uh, another presentation uh, uh, in a conference that Enrico and I were at was by Robert Gordon, and he talked about how productivity and potential GDP has shifted downward. That means it's going to be tougher to deal with all that spending. So that's that's really where that's coming from. And, you know, again, another presentation um, that was made, and again, I, I'm sure it's available uh, by. Um, uh, you know, uh, professor, uh, is that, you know, why has economic growth slowed down? And if you think about it, once again, you go through the fundamentals. One's productivity, second's labor force growth. And you've seen here, and the comments that many of you have seen o over the last year or two, labor force participation in the United States has really declined. Think about that employment population graph that I put up there. You just got less people working as a share of your population. Well, if you're going to provide the same services with fewer people, they better be very productive. And again, I think you have to understand the character of the overall U.S. economy has really changed. And the labor force has changed. And I think Enrico was really going to emphasize that later this morning for you. To your comment with regard to um, the impact on, on the policy of spending, what can governments do to keep the San Francisco Bay Area economy progressing? Uh, one, uh, don't penalize progress. I mean, you know, if you've got a winning team, you know, you keep the quarterback in there in the third and fourth quarter sometimes. Um, I think you keep your players healthy if you have a winning team. Uh, so I think that's number one is when, when you're winning, uh, don't change the game plan. Many of us, again, as you'll see with the 49ers and some other team this, this fall, um, they're ahead of the game. And in the third quarter, they say, well, we're going to have a prevent defense. And what inevitably happens? The other team scores three touchdowns and wins. Well, and then you say to yourself, well, why the heck did you change your defense? It was working so well. You know, you shut them out in the first three quarters, you went to a prevent defense, they scored three touchdowns in the fourth quarter, and they won the game. What the hell are you doing? Okay? So again, I would say, you know, go, go with the flow. Uh, don't penalize success. I think that's an absolutely key aspect. I think recognize the challenge you have of being, you know, and I won't use that other city reference, but, 
you, you have to recognize that you are an international global city that has a lot of high income, all right? You don't have a lot of land, all right? And you have all these constraints in terms of codes because you're worried about earthquakes. I got it, okay? But all of that makes your city very unique relative to other American cities, and you have to treat it as such. And I think so far, yeah, a lot of you have treated it as such. Um, again, the tourism thing is just phenomenal. Again, you, it, I mean, it's amazing, right? You've got two premier events in the same week. You had the America's Cup, and you had a whole bunch of economists at a convention. I mean, <laughs> that, was, that was phenomenal. You know, you think about that. I mean, you know, not many cities get both of those in the same week. So. Lucky us. Um, you know, apparently some of the crowd don't believe that you get it 100% right. So from oh, last absolutely. year's discussion, was there anything that surprised you that didn't go exactly as you had expected? So I would say uh, for most people, uh, one of the biggest uh, challenges right now is how a period of very low interest rates can persist and what in the heck is happening with respect to the Fed cutting back on tapering and the interest rates because I, I, there's a graph in the presentation where I look at inflation and interest rates and I, I think it, for an economics person, the argument is in, interest rates are way too low to be persistent over time. They're just inconsistent with all the other fundamentals. And the, the challenge for us is that as this thing has brought a broken open a little bit over the last year, and you've seen mortgage rates rise a little bit, and bond rates rise a little bit, 10-year treasury rates rise a little bit, the question is, is this thing gonna really start taking off on us in interest rates, or is this gonna stay somewhat modest? And I, I would say that um, our expectation had been that it was gonna be pick up a little bit more than what it has. Uh, but again, I think that's a real challenge because many of you are in the business of trying to finance, uh, especially in the construction business, short term versus long term. Am I gonna lock in something now for the longer term? And again, an another thing I would emphasize to you is the fact that mortgage rates have gone up 100 basis points or 150 basis points doesn't really all, mean all that much in San Francisco because your home prices are up 8 to 12 percent, okay? But if you think about a lot of other areas in California where home prices are flat to up 2 percent, well, 100 basis points or 150 basis points on the mortgage rate does make a difference. And when you look at the negative equity and you realize there are so few places in San Francisco that have neg negative equity, and yet in some other areas of California there's a lot of negative, negative equity, those 100, 150 basis points on mortgage rates do make a difference. So again, it's, it's kind of a, one, one great challenge you always have, especially like at Wells Fargo where you have everything all over the place, um, you realize that 100 basis points, 150 basis points change in interest rates has very, very disparate impacts in different metropolitan areas in the United States. So I think that's one of the, the challenges we have, yes. Okay, uh, you've touched on it a little bit, but it, with San Francisco's economy, it seems very positive. Does the proximity of other areas, Sacramento, San Jose, et cetera, is there impacts back and forth with regard to the economy in those areas can they influence San Francisco and vice versa? Oh, absolutely. I, did, I don't think there's any doubt um, that the prosperity that goes on in, in San Jose area makes a big difference in terms of what goes on here. Um, it, it's, uh, again, um, you think about the wealth that's being generated oftentimes comes back into the city in terms of uh, hotel spending and restaurant spending and cultural events. So yeah, it, it absolutely feeds uh, back and forth. I think that's, um, you know, when I look at other uh, major cities, you think about the relationship of New York City uh, to uh, parts of Connecticut or New Jersey. Uh, do they feed back into each other? Absolutely. Uh, Boston and its suburbs, does it feed back into each other? Absolutely. Uh, so there's a lot of going on there. If you, it, again, for those of you, I grew up in the Boston area, and, you know, our high tech was 128. Uh, and Raytheon and all those places. And did that feed back into the Boston economy? Absolutely. And when that place got crunched under Jimmy Carter, did it make a difference for the city of Boston? Absolutely. So yeah, I mean, it's, it's a metropolitan feedback effect. The nice thing you have 
is that you have a very interesting, a diversified metropolitan economy. Question with regard to the disparity between high and middle income earnings and what do you believe is sustainable? What are the future trends? Um, I, I would say that uh, the problem for me is the skills and the rewards to the skills. And that um, for only the post-World War II period, uh, before the technology really hit, uh, when the U.S. was really the dominant economic force in the world, the challenge became uh, we had a manufacturing base that pretty much was the only manufacturing base in the world that really mattered. And before the technology, we had a lot of paper that needed to be shuffled. Uh, the evolution of the U.S. economy has been that those manufacturing jobs gradually got replaced by technology and machines, and a lot of those back office workers got replaced by computers that could handle the data. And so for me, those skills will continue to be underpaid relative to their own experience in the past. I think as we see the change in the U.S. economy, the good old boys, you know, the hardworking, you know, you listen to this country western music or you listen to sticks and it's always, you know, blue collar man and everything else. Well, yeah, great, that's great, it's romantic, it doesn't work. Um, you're not going to get paid for working harder. You're going to get paid for working smarter. Uh, and that's the nature of the game. Uh, we have just used a lot of technology to just make everything so much more efficient and better. So, yeah, uh, if, you go, if you're going to persist to continue to do what you did in the past, and it didn't work, it isn't going to work in the future. Great. Any, any last comments? Uh, enjoy your success. Appreciate it. Save for the rainy day. Uh, and uh, you're doing fine. Thank you very much.